It's Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. Watching television, watching television. A dynamite place to be. Dynamite! Sponsored by Vandalay Industries, importers and exporters of fine latex products since 1992. And now, the man who taught Frank Burns how to eat worms, here's your host, Phil Kahn. And thank you, John Meany, wherever you are. I am indeed Phil Kahn, and I welcome you to the latest installment of Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. I'm pleased to welcome today's guest, Joseph Stern. Now, you may recall Joe's appearance in the famous Adam's Ribs episode of M.A.S.H., but are you wondering where else you've seen his name? I'm guessing you recognize it from the closing credits of a number of TV shows and movies. In fact, he's probably best known for being the executive producer of Judging Amy, and also the co-executive producer for two seasons of Law & Order, which also included the pilot. And speaking of Law & Order, I'm most excited about a scoop I got today from Joe. You know the famous music bleak from Law & Order? You know it. (laughs) Dun-dun. Well, I have an exclusive. He gave me details on the origin of that now famous sound. So let's listen in on my recent chat with Joseph. Dun-dun. Hi, Joseph. Thanks so much for being with me today. Okay, my pleasure. Uh, We, of course, have a mutual friend, Doug Gladstone, and I interviewed Doug for my podcast, and the topic of Adam's Ribs came up, the famous MASH episode, because that was Doug's first nationally published news article was about Adam's Ribs, and apparently he had contacted you to get some background information. Anyway, to make a long story short, Doug said, I've got somebody you really need to interview, Joseph Stern. And he told me the role you played in the Adam's Rib episode, and it's like, yes, I have to call Joseph. So welcome. So glad to have you. All right. Call me Joe. Call you Joe. Oh, look, we're already on an informal first-name basis. I love it. Call me Phil. Okay. <laughs> so you played, for, for those who may not have seen the episode, although I'm guessing many people have, um, you played Master Sergeant Tarola. The premise is that Hawkeye is sick and tired of the same food being served every day in the mess, and he has a hankering for something different, and he wants ribs, and he can't think of the name of the place in Chicago. Anyway, to make a long story short, he goes through all these trials and tribulations, and he and Trapper get on the phone and eventually get ribs delivered. Now, could you tell us about your role in that famous episode? Well, it was called Adam Ribs, and it's from Dearborn, uh, Dearborn Station in Chicago, as I recall. And they go through, uh, you know, through different people until they get to me. I'm sort of the staff sergeant quartermaster, and I'm, I'm, I'm the person that gets, that would get the package of ribs that they finally figured out how to get uh, through uh, Trapper's girlfriend in Chicago, Mildred something, and she gets them the ribs, and and they, you know, and they. And they finally have to go and pick them up. The most important thing is my is the scene with me, and they come in. It's about a three minute scene, and in which you know I'm bla- basically playing sort of Phil Silvers as Bilko. Yeah, famous, yes. That's sort of the character, and uh, you know we go at it. It's pretty funny. And uh, yeah, you you know something's up. You're thinking you're wondering what the hell they're trying to hide from you. Have you seen Have you seen it, Phil? I have many times. Oh, well, so, so you know what it is. You know what. A, my part and uh and basically yeah we bargain and then you know finally you know they 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 have to give me some of the ribs and then i asked for the for some coleslaw and, you know at the end and they said they forgot they never got coleslaw and i, I go <laughs> and i go you did you sent all the way and you didn't know coleslaw and they say forgive us we're draftees you know? <laughs> that's the scene and the scene has appear, it appeared in some I've been contacted by anthologies on comedy or something. Anyways, that was uh, that was one of the first things I did um, when I came to. I was an actor in New York. I'd done the Hot L Baltimore and replaced Judd Hirsch, and came out here and did. You know, was on a television series. I was Karen Valentine's roommate, and then. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I did about fifteen shows. 
I did the Lindbergh kidnapping case with Anthony Hopkins. And then, uh, I don't know, I worked a lot for about three years. And that was the first or second thing that I did here when I got here. And uh, Do you remember your famous line from the uh, episode about what you do to, to get ribs? No, what is the famous line? <laughs> I'd walk to Chicago on my knees in a snowstorm for a takeout order. <laughs> That's correct. And I've seen it recently. I watched the episode a few I showed it to somebody. Uh, I, I, he says, I'm from Joliet. And I'd walk to, yes, that's exactly right. That's the line. That's the, And about every 15 years, somebody recognizes me from my voice. They hear me somewhere, and they say, oh, are you the guy who was on MASH? I remember when I was in New York years ago, and I was on the, on the train, and somebody heard me, and they came up to me. I was with my family, and they, they recognized my voice. That's so funny that it wasn't the face, it was the voice. No, I know. Well, it was 40 years ago. I mean, then it was 20 years ago, you know. And they're still playing it. I still get a, res I get a residual. It's my biggest residual. I get about 25, 30 bucks every time they play it. Oh, get out of here. Yeah, honestly, yeah. I think it's up to over 100 times it's been played. No kidding. I will have to call all these TV stations and encourage them to keep playing it. <laughs> yeah, they keep playing. Oh, they're playing it all the time still. Depends on where they play it as to how much money you get, you know. So sometimes, you know, you know, I get residuals from four or five other shows, although I haven't, you know, done anything since 1977. And uh, you know, sometimes you get a check for one cent. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. Do you even bother cashing it? I, I went into cash it at the, my bank, and the guy said, the teller said, "How do you want it, heads or tails?" <laughs> it's an old joke of mine, but it's true. But a boom, that's good. I love it. Yeah. But they really have checks for a penny and two cents, like Law and Order sends them out for the cable checks. You know, it's hysterical. That's so funny. And then, uh, you know, I quit acting and I went into television and uh, I bought a theater and I've been I've done about 50 plays. It's called The Matrix. It's very well known. It's in Los Angeles. And uh, I, uh, I started producing television. I went to work for a man named Dan Curtis and we did The Winds of War and a bunch of other stuff. And then, you know. Then I ended up uh, producing the pilot in the first three years of uh, Law and Order, and then uh, and then I did the six years of Judging Amy, and then I did Dad for Spielberg with Gary David Goldberg, Jack Lemmon, and uh, you know a lot of stuff. I just never stopped working, and then I've done a lot of plays. You know. Why did you decide to give up acting and go into producing? Well, I've always been sort of had the producing kind of. Uh, Chops, I, you know, through school, college, high school, whatever, and I produced a play. I moved the play from Long Wharf to New York in 1969. And then, uh, you know, so I had, you know, 10 years. I did six plays for Joe Papp at the New York Shakespeare Festival in the park. And you know, it was just a question of time when I was going to do it professionally. And, and I just got up one morning and said, that's it. And I, I, uh, called some people and six weeks later I had a job with Dan Curtis it was in 1977 I'd been out here about three years uh, back I grew up here and I went to New York and got married and was an actor in New York for 10 years and you know worked for Joe and and uh, produced a play and then so it was that's and then I just never looked back you know I started my theater where I produced for about 40 years there first play I did was about the uh, the UAC committee, House of American Activities Committee, mm -hmm. uh, the Hollywood, sort of the Hollywood 10. It's called Are You Now or Have You Ever Been? And that was, you know, that ran for about a year and a half here. And then I, that was before I got the Matrix. And then I got the rights to all of Harry Chapin's music. And I created a show about Harry Chapin's music. And then ended up doing a sequel to it called Lies and Legends. We did it at the Apollo in New York. And wow. I'm sorry, in Chicago. And then it went to uh, the Village Gate in New York, and it's been playing all over the country for about 40 years. And, uh, you know, and this, uh, been, you know, every year I, I make a film and then also produce a play. And that went on for forever. And then the last seven or eight years I've been dealing with race. I did a multi-ethnic production of Arthur Miller's All My Sons, mm. which was very interesting. And then... Uh, you know, this play Neighbors, which is, you can see on my website, the Matrix Theater website, you can see the, uh, thing that we put in festivals, a very provocative play about race. 
Um, and we did a you know number of plays about different different uh, uh, approaches to race. Different. It was sort of you know some some about upper class, some middle class, um, and just different takes. And you know, uh, uh, with the theme always being about race. Why did you uh, decide to uh, choose that as a theme to hone in on recently? I had always been interested in race, and I got an award from Screen Actors Guild when I was doing Law and Order in the early 90s because I had employed the most um, um, African-American actors. I made them judges and lawyers. And then when I got on Judging Amy, I began to integrate them beyond that. I changed some of the stories so that they were biracial or or about that. So it, it, would always a de- it always was a very strong interest for me, both personally and politically. Mm-hmm. And I started doing it just about before Obama became president. Oh. Uh, but I started, you know, ch- changing my theater, which was classical with all, which was made up of a lot of great actors like, you know, David Dukes and Anna Gunn and, and, uh, Byron Jennings, a lot of New York actors and well-known actors who went on, uh, to, you know, fame and fortune and we had the best actors and then I decided I was just going to deal with race so basically my my company of actors sort of you know I really didn't participate much it was mostly 75 percent of them was uh was uh multi-ethnic and most of them being african-american some others you know latino and and uh and then and then last year you know, a year and a half ago I did a play about Martin Luther King uh, with, that was done on Broadway with Samuel L. Jackson and Angela Bassett, which mm-hmm. was not successful. It was directed here by a black actor named Roger Governor Smith, who's been in a lot of different Spike Jones, Spike, uh, Spike Lee movies. And then it's going to be playing in Memphis at, uh, on the anniversary of, uh, Martin Luther King's death in April of next year at the Orpheum, which is a 2000. So it'll be the production that we started at the Matrix. So, and I'm getting ready to do a play that was done on Broadway 40 years ago called Runaways. Uh, it was a big uh, music. It was done for 20, it's 25 young people of different ethnicities who are living on the streets. It's got music, and so, so it's a huge project. So we'll be doing that in the spring. You're not slowing down at all. You've got so many irons in the fire, so many things going on. Uh, no, I'll never. No, I'm, you know, so it's, you know. And a lot of the stuff I did had a lot political. You know, I did the first movie. Ninety-three, I did uh, play a movie called Other Mothers about uh, a lesbian couple raising a, a, a child, mm-hmm. 15-year-old. And the whole idea was that uh, raise, the fact that you were raised by uh, um, gay parents uh, did not have anything to do with the predisp- predisposition that their child would be gay. So I had to produce studies and stuff oh. uh, for CBS to show that that was true. Really? It wasn't much. And oh, yeah, and I had to get letters from uh, sh- psychiatrists and child development people. You and then it went on the Yeah, it was with Meredith Baxter Bernie, or Meredith Baxter, and, and we had an all-star cast of Judith Ivey and Joe Ragabuto, and and uh, it was a total sponsor pullout, 1993. No kidding. Um, yep, yeah, they pulled out all the sponsors. It was a good article. It was just too controversial at the time? Yeah, it was very controversial that the premise being that uh, the female gay couple would, uh, you know, raise a child. You know, if this had been 40 years ago, I could see sponsors pulling out, but... No, it was uh, 25 years ago, 1993. That's unbelievable. It's called Other Mothers. We got a bunch of Emmys, and uh, it was very provocative. And then, uh, and I, you know, and I did, I did a, these were these one-hour specials about, you know, for young adults on CBS and ABC. And I did one about abortion. Mm-hmm. I gave a terrific actress, Jennifer Jason Lee. Oh yes, yeah, she was in it. And then you know, on Law and Order, we we made a lot. I made a lot of people uh, sag. Like, uh, so getting so bad with names. Um, yeah, you and me both. Um, um, you know, she's Claire Danes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of we had a lot of you know a lot of people do their first shows for me those three years. Um, um, Felicity Huffman, mm. uh, Mira Sorvino. We had 15 or 20 actors that had really got their first shots on Law and Order in those 
first three years that I was on when I was on it. So, uh, you know, um, um, the woman who ended up on Law and Order, uh, African American actress, uh, was on it for twenty years. That's a Pesa. Um, a Pesa Merkison. Thank and you. Dick Wolf got to know her from that and cast her in that part. So. Oh, she was terrific. Yeah, she was great. So you were executive producer for three seasons for for Law and Order. First two seasons I was co-executive, and the third season I was the executive producer and only person ever to get the credit in the back with Dick Wolf. And then, uh, you know, and then judging Amy, I was partners with Barbara Hall, who has uh, Madam Secretary now. And, uh, uh, you know, I just kind of never looked back for about 30 years, you know. While I, and then the last, as I say, the last seven of eight years, I kind of, you know, uh, got out of television and I was really, you know, involved in uh, in diversity, speaking on it at different colleges, and then and then dedicating my theater to that, you know, and doing a production every year that you know that had racial themes, and uh, and that sort of you know, and then I did a pilot about four years ago for NBC with Alfonso Caron called uh, Believe. Uh, Believe. Uh, you know, while he he was waiting to to release Gravity, the movie that he won the Academy Award for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and now I'm back in television. I'm trying to develop a miniseries about St. Francis of Assisi. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so I don't, I don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> what haven't you done that you want to do? That's a really good question, you know. I, I think... Um, I think I, I'm doing it by getting being a little bit ahead of things in terms of of race. You know how, what impo how important it is to our culture. And I, I think I was just a little bit ahead of my time in that sense, of, or so I've been told. What do you, th you know, typically Hollywood, quote unquote, has a reputation of being very progressive, and yet you look at. Uh, like racial, ethnic uh, representation on TV. I did an interview on my podcast recently with Danny Woodburn, who played Mickey on Seinfeld, uh, the little mm -hmm. person. We were talking about the difficulties of getting folks with disabilities um, work or having subject matter um, covered in TV shows, movies. Uh, why do you think it's been slow on the uptake with that? Well, you know, I mean, it just hasn't, you know, I mean, look, it took uh, 30 or 40 years for a, for a, a black female lead with Scandal. Yeah. It, it never worked. The James Earl Jones had a show. It was, it, was, it was not done. It was not, you know, there's been a whole explosion, you know, and you're still fighting it. You know, you're still reading articles and studies where there's not enough diversity in television and film, not only for uh, African Americans and Asian, you know, Asian actors mm -hmm. um but even women you know so you've seen you know there's be, it's become a big political issue and uh you know and uh and i believe that i kind of my whole career has been about that and we were you know um i think we were a little bit ahead of our time and uh um and and so that's been the focus of my work or part of it you know for these many years and basically, when I was on Judging Amy, the only show they didn't rerun out of 138 was when, um, did you ever see Judging Amy? Sure. Well, you remember the, the black actor, Richard T. Jones, who was her mm -hmm. associate. Well, they have a dream sequence where, where they kiss. And that was the only show that was never repeated because they got hate mail. You're kidding. No. In this day and age? I've never told that story. I was 2005. Oh, my God. Yeah, they got hate mail. That's all they needed was that. In this day and age. I, I can't believe that. You know, daytime television was ahead of nighttime television in terms of uh, interracial stories and characters and relationships. I remember there was a Star Trek episode where there was the interracial kiss between Captain Kirk and Ahura and that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Were, <laughs> that caused a big uproar. That show had good politics, you know. They really did. Uh so do you feel you're making a dent in this issue? Well, I, you know, I'm just contributing. I certainly have made a, a impact in Los Angeles theater. 
Mm. I can't say that I haven't. You know, I mean, my when I look back at all the things I've made, they're they're they're, they're politically. You know, they're, I've made shows about. You know, in the first year of Law and Order, which they've gotten away from, we made shows from abortion to AIDS to you name it. And I think people got scared. The ratings weren't that high. They were also concerned about um, too many shows about um, uh, African Americans and okay. the crimes started to become about, you know, became white collar crime. Mm-hmm. I think the first three years I was, we did a show about Malcolm X and. You know, we had a lot of great shows, but they, I think, it was not highly rated, the show. And, uh, you know, I know as soon as I left, they, they finally, they replaced uh, two regulars, males with two females, which was fine, you know. Mm-hmm. But they were, you know, there was a certain concern about it. Um, and uh, um, and so the show did change politically, I know, when I left. And... Uh, uh, um, I think NBC was concerned, but you know, <laughs> it went on for twenty years, right, right. <laughs> and, you know, and it became certainly one of the most important shows in television, just aesthetically. And basically, what we were doing was uh, docudramas. Absolutely. That's why there was so little music, and that's why there was so little personal stories. You know, it was all about the issues. Absolutely. And then, of course, there's the very famous dun-dun-dun that everybody does from the beginning uh, of the show. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the story of how that came about. Oh, please. Which is, I was going to write the guy in the New York Times to tell him, because he wrote about it about two months ago, James Ponsacella, Ponsatelli, I can't remember his name, he has a uh-huh. column. Yeah, well, we shot the thing as a, like a documentary, and um, we shot the pilot, and there were no masters. For your audience, masters are a wide shot of everything. Then you go in for all the close-ups. Okay? okay. You go in for the coverage. Okay? So we shot it. So basically, when we put the thing together, we had what we called jump cuts, which was uh, there were no masters. So from going from scene to scene, it would be a jump cut. Mm-hmm. You couldn't, you couldn't, in terms of its fluidity, it, it, it couldn't, um, you know, it was too jarring. So basically, in order to do that, we put in, which was the head of the television studio, a man named Kerry uh, uh, McCluggage, mm-hmm. uh, he put in those cards. You know, uh, those cards that you see, you know, uh, six court district, well, all those different cards you see between scenes so that it wouldn't be jump cuts. Sure. And that and grew out of it was the famous Mike Post. You know, uh, dum 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 dum. What do you want to call it? Right, dum dum dum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was that was from that was because we had to correct a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Isn't it funny how these things happen? Yeah, that's how it was born. That's how it was born. <laughs> yeah, we sat we sat in the in his office and he said, "I got an idea," and that's how it happened. Uh, great story. I meant to write that to the, to the New York Times guys. Maybe I will still. I kept the article because he wrote all about it, you know. But I, nobody knows the backstory of how it happened. Oh, see, I'm getting all these scoops here from you, Joe. This yeah, is that's great. A, that's a scoop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. call the guy from the Times. I want to. I want to have the scoop on this one. <laughs> okay, I'll give it a two month delay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that consideration. Yeah. Now, I would like to. I'm sure you're a modest man, but in reading your resume and your website, um, you're the most highly decorated theater uh, producer in L.A.'s history. You've had 40 L.A. Drama Critics Circle Awards. I could go on and on. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm one of three people who've been here the longest. And basically, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's really been, you know, I, I wouldn't call it a hobby, but there's, you know, it's been my... Uh, I don't know what the word is, you know. Um, it's my charity work. It's not really charity, you know. It's it's uh, it's really a, it, it's a contribution that I have made that does not have any any uh, uh, financial reward. There's never been. It's, it's it's strictly a labor of love, and it's been you know that, that that's so that's been forty years of that, and so that's you know that's. 
you know, that, that's my contribution to the culture, uh, and that has always has been, you know, among other. That's been my primary, you know. So, in Los Angeles, which has mm-hmm. never gotten the respect that it should have gotten from New York. Yeah, why is that? Let me you know for just a second. Why doesn't L.A. carry the same cachet that New York theater does? Well, because L.A. has got everything else. You know, we've got the movie industry. We've become a major sports industry with the decline of the Knicks and the Jets. Um, and and basically, you know, New York's claim to fame is their theater. You know, and, and once we started to grow in stature, in our work and, and the respect we got, and we began to send shows around the world, uh, they became invested in um, in negating our art, our art because you know people may not know, but our actors don't get paid for the most part. They get mm-hmm. uh, they get car fare and stipends because we don't get any grants. You know, the, only the you know the, the music center gets it, and a few other places. So basically, this is a movement. A forty-year movement of actors creating, of artists creating their own environment because they always will, and mm-hmm. there was never any money. You know, we never got it. There was no commerce, and we created our own theater. You know, like actor managers, and New York has spent many years uh, trying to shut us down, and they tried to shut us down thirty years ago. We sued them, and and they were not able to do it. And in the last three years, they finally were able to do it. They spent a million dollars in legal fees to shut us down. So basically now the theater is changing in some way, and that is that we're not, you know, we're not, we don't have the money to sign contracts. Mm-hmm. So we, we've now turned more and more to non-union actors. Uh, there's still a, a whole movement of actors that they acknowledge, but in two or three years they'll get rid of them, which they're called company where equity actors are allowed to do it. So they've had some effect on our work for no reason other than New York's, my belief, New York wanting to, uh, you know, to uh, um, get rid of us. And it's not, a, it's not a conspiracy theory. You're on different coasts. It's not like you're competing well, no, for the same audiences. No, what, no. What's, the, what's the issue? The issue is that they, uh, they want to... Uh, as they have for many years, negate our work. That there's somehow there's a difference between a West Coast artist and an, and an East Coast artist, which is, of course, nonsense because yeah. people have emigrated here, but they created a situation where the bigger theaters here uh, did not want to hire West Coast talent, designers, directors, actors. Uh, they, they drank the Kool-Aid. Mm-hmm. And basically what's happened is that that has begun to change. Because, as I say, we've sent so many shows around the world and around the country that started here yep. that, uh, you know, so, you know, there is, you know, we've had to fight for that respect. And it's uh, it's a, a, it's not a union that I have a lot of respect for, let's put it that way. And even though I'm still a member for 50 years, I pay my dues. But it's I'm I'm ashamed of their behavior, frankly. It's shameful what they've done and tried to do. And uh I don't get it. I don't get uh, it. Yeah, a lot of, most people don't get it either. It's all about, you know, and they they put out they negotiated with us in bad faith and it's all about uh it's all about uh, uh a n a nonsensical physical thing. That they're trying to, you know, that actors deserve to be paid nine dollars an hour. The actors don't want the nine dollars an hour, and they've doubled and tripled the budgets for these theaters, and a lot of them have gone under in the last year or two. Huh. And uh, yeah, it's a whole other issue. <laughs> and how's the Matrix? Is the Matrix struggling now because of yeah, it? it's affe- yeah, it's affected me, and that's why I'm doing a show with 25 young people who are not members of the union. But, or, or, you know, it's affected me in terms of my program because most of the actors I use who are, you know, different ethnicities are members of the union. And yeah. it has prevented them from working, and they're very upset. They don't, All they get to do is one or two lines as the gardener or, so, or something else in features. This is a place where they get to do, this theater allows them to do checkoff and bigger parts, and they've been denied a lot of it, this movement. What a shame. And they had no data. We had all the data. We showed them everything. You know what the average ticket price was, what the what the grants were, and that there was no, and that basically they were going to deny, you know, 
artists uh, the ability to work. The culture has completely changed, and they have not gone with it. They have not, you know, have had no empathy and no understanding of of the American artist, and they've done everything in their power to destroy it. That's unbelievable. So it's a whole other thing. We've been spending years on this. You know, we had we had we raised a hundred thousand dollars from the community to hire lawyers and and to plead our case, and it it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. So what happens now? Well, we just go on. You know, I go on. You know, I I you know I I will you know hire actors who are, who are not members of the union of equity. We were hiring screen actor go ahead. And regular, well, you more younger people will get an opportunity to act and be developed. You know, I'm not going to quit. And none of us are going to quit. If, if you need me, I can fly out there for you. My uh, my one dream in life has been to have a cameo appearance in either a movie or TV show, even if I just have to walk on and serve somebody a drink. <laughs> I, I, I made my lawyer, who was not an actor, a judge on uh, Law and Order. While I was there. He still gets the residual checks. Oh, that's great. <laughs> He was a great friend of mine. Yeah, his, his name was Richard. T name is Richard Tickton. He's a big theatrical attorney, and that he considers that one of his great thrills. Maybe I can be a judge one day for you. Yeah, it could only happen. I should only have a show. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, keep fighting the good fight, Joe. That's what it is, Phil. <laughs> I thank you so much for being on. Okay, kiddo. I'd like to thank my guest, Joe Stern. Joe. I learned an awful lot from you today about film, TV, and theater, and really enjoyed our fascinating conversation. Oh, and thank you for the dun-dun scoop. <laughs> We hope you've had a dynamite time listening to this edition of Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. Join us again next time for another Stroll Down Memory Lane. Until then, let's be careful out there.